Okay. <clears throat> Uh, welcome everyone. I can see that we have um, participants um, are joining in. Um, welcome to our um, event on the Hidden uh, History series organized by the SOAS Decolonizing Working Group. Uh, my name is Angelica Basquera. I'm one of the convener of the series together with my colleagues um, Ludi Price, Fazana Kureshin and Amapoku. Um, they will be joining us shortly. Um, we are very thankful in particular for today's event to Ludi Price, who has brought this event uh, to SOAS. And uh, we are very grateful uh, and very delighted to welcome the uh, Andoku Andu Poets uh, orga um, Organization. Welcome uh, to all the fellow. And I will uh, just give a brief introduction um, about the organization before passing on to the fellow uh, to tell us a little bit more. Um, the Andocu Poets is an organization whose mission is to promote the work of poets undocumented in, in the US and raise consciousness about the structural barriers that they face in the literary community. In 2015, Andocu Poets successfully worked with 10 renowned first book poetry contests to update their submissions guidelines all of which requires some form of immigration status uh, in order to reflect a more incl inclusive publishing. As of 2017, the uh, Andrew offer uh, competitive annual grants of uh, $500 to two poets with no string attached, um, which I really like that. Uh, so a very interesting organization, an organization that speaks to issues of migration that are very uh, close to uh, the SOAS a vision and mission and um, so we are very uh, very interesting to hear from you tonight and to um and to reflect uh, upon those uh, very um difficult issues that are very close to us uh, and so we are very happy to hear from first hand experiences of poets uh, and their stories um uh, tonight we are very pleased to have uh, um here with us um the participants for the organization, Janine Joseph, who's going to be chairing uh, the panel tonight, um, who is a poet and libertarist from the Philippines, and she's the author of Driving Without a License, winner of the Condiment Poetry Prize um, and Decade of the Brain, both from Alice James Books. Uh, she will be introducing in, in, in more details than I will not right now, uh, the other fellow, who are uh, Toby Cassin, um, from Ibadan, Nigeria, Annie Liu uh, from Xi'an uh, in China, Aline Mello uh, from Brazil, and Oswa uh, Oswaldo Vargas um, uh, from uh, based in California. Um, and yeah, so I am really, really excited to hear your story, your poems, your readings. And um, we are very, very grateful again that you made the time uh, so early uh, to be here. Also, thank you to the audience, um, again, from uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We know we have audiences uh, joining us from uh, all over the world. And um, so um, I, we are very, very grateful. And we thank you uh, on behalf of SOAS and on behalf of the Hidden History uh, series. Um, I will now uh, pass it on to Janine. Uh, Joseph, who is going to uh, introduce the, uh, the fellow and then the fellow will uh, will do the reading. And then at the end, uh, we will have some time for Q&A uh, from the audience. So we would like the audience to, um, during the um, during the event, to put the question in the Q&A box that you can see at the bottom of your screen. Um, put your question there, and then we will aim to answer um, at least some of them uh, at the end of the, the discussion and the, and the readings. Um, okay, thank you so much. I'm, um, I'm now uh, pass it on to uh, Janine to, to, uh, to welcome the fellow. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. And um, I know we're convening from a number of time zones. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's actually really wonderful to, to be here as part um, of this Undocu Poets event, um, to be here all at the same time, but somehow not at the same time, and to be here in close proximity to one another. I feel like somehow this, uh, this particular event and this particular moment in time speaks so um, 
so truly and so close to a lot of our experiences in that they're, they're just slightly overlapping, but not quite uh, close to one another. Um, but yet somehow all hitting uh, at the same uh, at the same kind of like central point. Um, just really just wonderful to be here and um, and really to to bring all of the all of these four fellows together. Um, I know we're all probably just getting to know each other for the first time by Zoom today. So this is uh, especially exciting. Um, I just wanted to say a few more words about Undaki Poets and then um, introduce the fellows in the order in which they'll be reading today. Um, so as mentioned, uh, my name is Janine Joseph and I am one of three co-organizers uh, for Undaki Poets, which uh, again, as mentioned, is a nonprofit organization that supports and promotes the work of poets who are currently or who were formerly undocumented in the US. Um, my fellow co-organizers are um, the co-founder Marcelo Hernandez Castillo and Esther Lin, who is also one of the inaugural Undocu Poet Fellows. Um, it's a really exciting time for Undocu Poets uh, in the coming weeks and months. We'll be announcing and launching a new website for Undocu Poets um, and also announcing a few more um, initiatives and programs that, um, yeah, that we're just really looking forward to, to sharing with you all. Um, and DocuPoets really works to serve our literary community by supporting the art, the art of poets who are currently or who were formerly undocumented, um, advocating for underrepresented immigrants who feel that they lack a voice to challenge institutions policies, as noted by um, the work of our co-founders, uh, Marcelo Hernandez Castillo, uh, Christopher Soto and Javier Zamora in, um, in putting together this open letter that propelled these presses and these publishers um, to change their eligibility guidelines, which were discriminatory towards people um, born uh, in different countries and who are coming to the United States with different and varying immigration statuses. Um, something that we do too is we try to expand the awareness um, for allies who want who wouldn't otherwise know of such barriers that are faced um, in this in our literary community. Um, today's reading and conversation will highlight the work of four of our Undocu Poet Fellows. To date, we have 13 Undocu Poet Fellows, um, and I hope that their work will showcase the range and depth of their experiences, identities, geographies, and aesthetics and approaches. Um, as noted in the description and the publicity material for this event, um, I, I, mean, I believe this, um, this little this little phrase comes from something that Alini, I believe you wrote, poetry doesn't feed mouths, doesn't build homes, doesn't cure systemic ills. But what we have here um, is, you know, a sampling of work written by poets who are currently or who are formerly undocumented in America, who, you know, choose metaphor and line as a, as a way of uh, making their way through a country that doesn't recognize them or doesn't acknowledge them. Um, I'll say a little bit about uh, each of our speakers and the order in which they'll read. So our first reader uh, is Annie Liu, who is the 2017 uh, Undocupote Fellow, an inaugural fellow. Annie Liu was born in Xi'an in the year of the goat. She is the author of Border Vista, which won the 2021 Lexi Rudnitsky Prize from Persia Books. And her work is featured in Poetry Magazine, Bow Shares, Ecotone, Two Lines, and elsewhere. She received an inaugural, or inaugural Undocu Poets Fellowship and was recently named a Janikian Scholar by the Adroit Journal. She is currently working on a hybrid memoir about parole, translating the poetry of Huya, and editing fiction and nonfiction at Grey Wolf Press. Our second reader is Alini Mello. Alini Mello is a Brazilian poet and editor. Her work often centers around themes of identity, religion, and the body, and the experience of living of the self living in diaspora. Her immigrant and undocumented identity have influenced her writing and her art. 
She, she is an Andaki Poets Fellow and an MFA candidate at the Ohio State University. Her debut poetry collection, More Salt Than Diamond, is out now. Our third reader will be Oswaldo Vargas. Oswaldo Vargas is a 2021 Andaki Poets Fellow. Oswaldo is a former farm worker, a graduate of the University of California, Davis, and, um, and as I mentioned, a 2021 Andaki Poets Fellow. Oswaldo's anthology features include Nepantla, an anthology dedicated to queer poets of color. If you can hear this, poems and protests of an American inauguration, Imaniman, poets writing the Ansalduan borderlands and Puru Chicanix writers of the 21st century. His work can also be seen in the Louisville Review, Queen Mob's Tea House, Huizakche, the Santos Review, Rasta Magazine, Glass Poetry Press, West Trade Review, Dovecote Magazine, Midway Journal, Somos en Escrito, Pine Hills Review, Bosalta, and the Green Mountains Review tribute issue to former U.S. Poet Laureate Juan Felipe Herrera. He lives and dreams in Sacramento, California. And our final reader of the evening, Toby Kasim, also a 2021 Andaki Poets Fellow. Toby was born in Ibadan, Nigeria, and has lived in the United States since 20, since 20, since 2003. His work has been supported by Stadler Center Undergraduate Fellowship and an Andaki Poets Fellowship. He won Yale University's Sean T. Lannan Poetry Prize, and his poems have been published in the Volta, the Brooklyn Review, the Hampton Sydney Poetry Review, Zocalo Public Square, and elsewhere. I'm looking forward to hearing you all read your work um, into our conversation after the reading. Annie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Janine. Um, it's so wonderful to be here um, with my fellow fellows, um, but also with SOAS. It's incredible to be part of this Hidden Histories series. Um, yeah, and to just and to be with all of you know all of you who are in the audience too. Thank you for coming. Um, so I'm gonna read poems from Border Vista. Here's the book. It's probably backwards for all of you. Um, and before I start, I guess I want to say a little bit about the title, um, which comes from one poem in the collection. Um, but which is actually a technical term for um, a national border where the wilderness is so dense that it has to be cut down or deforested um, in order for it to be policed and maintained. Um, the particular border vista that I lived very close to um, in 2013 to 15 was the US Canada one um, in Vermont. And that one uh, is six meters across in the woods, which is 20 feet. Um, and it's colloquially, colloquially known as the slash and can be seen from space, um, much like the Great Wall of China. Uh, and so I think about that space, um, which a friend recently told me is a kind of negative of the DMZ, which has become kind of a wilderness, a protected wilderness area, you know, sort of by accident. Um, but I think of that space between Canada and the US and all those trees that were cut down and that kind of empty space, the kind of scar across the forest. Um, and some of these poems, you know, trees are very important throughout the book. And I think about the trees of that space being kind of resurrected um, to keep company with the trees of my poems um, and about kind of how the book traces um, my life, my family's life and lives of others like us who have this kind of, um, this slash cut through, right? And, um, and I'm really interested in, I love that um, Oswaldo's bio mentioned dreaming 
Um, I'm really interested in dreaming as another kind of border vista, but one which is so fruitful, um, one where you can see and be in both places or you know, where the kind of porousness of experience is one that's cherished rather than um, policed. Okay, that's what I will say. And now for some poems. The first one is called The Story. I was born in Xi'an, a 3000 year old city encircled by walls. Before I arrived, my mother visited me in dreams. A girl, my father's hair, my mother's mouth. She waited, devouring shrimp and green apples. Seven years later, she left. My father bought a red motorcycle. It gleamed gold specks in red enamel. My grandfather moved into the campus apartment where my mother's books were still stacked and my father stayed on the other side of town. Sun fell through knotted curtains. The moon visited us in turn. In summer, the road out of campus kicked dirt in our faces. Sweat mixed with dirt made a new and tougher skin. In winter, motorcycle rides with white cotton face masks and stiff wool coats, the airs silt like snow. I heard her voice on the telephone. Where do you miss me? But I could not locate missing in my body. Why document this? as if forgetting were the worst thing. The ocean came to my city once, city once mine, city so dry and ill-equipped that any hard rain will make it flood. It was no ocean, just the sky. If your city floods with streets like asphalt riverbeds, carry your child to piano lesson on your back, wear shower slippers, the only waterproof shoes you own, Be prepared for nails, a long nail, the arch of the foot. Another time, me fevered for days, my mother gone. My father took me to work. He spread couch cushions on the office floor for me to lie on, asked me what I needed. Tell me a story, I said. He never told stories, but that day he told me this. It has a happy ending. The bunnies find their way home to their mother, but her eyes, exhausted of tears, fall to the ground. Trees spring up where they land, trees with eyes in their bark. My mother never came back. Instead, I went to her, to Ohio and lead skies. After the story was over, the rabbits sheltered under the eye trees. My father covered me with a thin blanket. I had fallen asleep. He could go back to work. Um, I think that poem was really interesting to me because I was really trying to think about what it means to tell our stories um, as undocumented or formerly undocumented poets. And, what parts of our stories we want to share, how we want to shape them. So that particular story that my father told me is a real one that he he did tell, and I left um, a blank spot on the page um, because I wanted to keep that for myself. Um, and so there's sort of a gap there, and, and I just am silent in that part of the poem. Um, memory in a foreign language. Weekday afternoons, I walk from school to the English class in the foreign language university. The air is the color of amber, or it is only this way in memory, which has stained it like a film remastered. Here I learn a language is the way someone you love looks when speaking it. And English is my mother, moving her face in ways she does not at home long pursed O's, wide smile that's almost a grimace. The lesson underway sounds with the letter L. I mimic the sounds, my voice swallowed by the class. I stretch my mouth and feel the shape of what 
I don't yet understand. Chanting, lack, luck, lock, lack, luck, lock. And what happens next, I don't remember yet. It's also an inviting interest of mine um, to write about childhood experiences that happened in a different language in English, which was the foreign language, and which of course is a colonial language. Um, and there's so much to say there about power and about, um, about our relationship to that. Um, okay, changing gears a little. Now we are in Vermont, close to that border vista that I talked about. Um, and this one is called Night Swim at Shadow Lake. I can barely swim, but I don't tell them that. At the beach, the guys joke about leeches longer than my hand. They strip and hoot with pleasure as they, loop, as they leap off the slick rock. I keep my underwear on, feel my way in, the rocks first becoming dirt, then a soft sucking silt. Without my glasses, the lake surface gleams oiled with stars. Someone once told me to imagine the water holding me up to the air, buoyant, but all I do is sink. The lake's long fingers plug my ears, grip me like a hand closing. Panicked, I plash back to the shallow muck and wait. In the car, back to the farm, I sit with towels stuffed between my legs. No one tells any jokes. In the tensed silence, I realize they'd meant for me to take off all my clothes. I roll down my window, let in the night and its shrill insect trills, its sharp slaps of wind. My entire life, I have been afraid of the wrong things. Okay. another Vermont poem. This one is called Permit, and it's long and skinny like this on the page. I learned to drive in a blizzard. I was 22 and could finally legally work my job at the China Moon Buffet, 30 minutes away from the two bedroom where we lived a mile from the border. He was, tw he was 33 in the passenger seat of his $800 Forester, saying almost nothing as I inched up the snow thick road. Who knows where the asphalt ended and the woods began? The packed snow beneath the tires made a noise like pressing and bending the pages of a book, the sound of something crushed against itself. He was always teaching me something. Even after I got licensed, I never considered driving away. Okay, so as you can see, those Vermont poems are kind of suffused with, a, with many different kinds of fear um, and the ways those kind of compound each other because of our proximity to the border and that constant reminder of how unsafe I was. Um, the final poem I'll read um, is a prosy one called Entries from the Hottest Year on Record. Um, and it kind of goes across the, the page like this and they're numbered. Thank you so much for listening. Entries from the hottest year on record. One, woke up early to write, killed flies instead. Two, in the pot, I boil bones with hua jiao and fennel attempting to reproduce a past taste. The result is a gray diluted broth, ghost enough to conjure. Three, on Facebook, you can tag a picture as my grandmother. If you hover your mouse over the blue tag, you can see 5,017 pictures of my grandmother, none of them mine. Four, 
the slap of plastic slippers against cement. How long have I imagined you in your absence? Five. I remember it will rain today, then look up to see it is already raining. Six. The season slides, excuse me, the season slides to a close. A woman kneels over a tub of water, in it a dark muscle circling. Seven. The relationship, the question of the relationship between suffering, sorrow, and sorriness, what equation could be formed, if any? Eight. Microsoft wants to correct my uncertainties. When I write maybe, it underlines it, suggests I correct it by removing the maybe. If you shut one eye, depth disappears. Nine. I want to become legal again and permanent. I tried to draw a pine cone, distract myself with a manageable difficulty. 10, what was it they asked you? Why did you? They couldn't connect the dots. Why didn't you? The story didn't line up. 11, having one-sided conversations is a form of madness. Devotion to an entity that cares not for you is a delusion, which is another form of madness. Endless waiting is one more. Anger, a madness, grief. 12. I once thought myself impervious to disaster, immune to loss. Sure, bad things happened, but not to someone like me. 13. Doppler effect as one way of understanding positionality. The siren's wail changes depending on where you are in relation to its movement and on whether or not you perceive yourself as arrestable, as unlawful, as the one whom it seeks. 14, loneliness, having no one to tell you stories about yourself. 15, after many years of not wanting to, I decided to forgive my father but the decision could not be implemented for many years after. 16, Virginia Woolf, describing how she felt upon seeing a performance of Chekhov's The Cherry Orchard, quote, like a piano played upon at last, not in the middle only, but all over the keyboard and with the lid left open so that the sound goes on. 17, that skinless feeling, your own endlessly permeable self. Thank you. Um, I can come next. That's correct, okay. So I'm gonna start with, so here's my book. It's very pretty. <laughs> um, and I actually, have a prologue um and usually it's not normal for a book of poetry to have a prologue so I always make sure to read it just to be like you know it's, it's my it's extra of me and I'm gonna go ahead and, and read from it so I'm gonna sandwich some poems from the book with some new poems um I always feel like I don't know like it feels weird to read from something that I wrote so long ago you know while I'm like writing new stuff. So um, I'm gonna try and, and spice it up with reading from, from both. Prologue. Oh, also before I start, I'm so thankful uh, that I'm here. I love seeing my fellow undocumented poets and I've met Annie and Janine before in person. Um, I've never met Osvaldo or Toby. So it's so good to meet you on Zoom. Um, I hope that we get to meet in person um, at some point. So here we go, prologue. When I was little, I imagined I could control the wind. I would stand in the gathering of trees beyond the parking lot of our apartment building, arms by my side, and listen to a growing wrestle, feel for a movement of my arm hair. When I sensed the wind was coming, I'd raise my arms as if I'd called it forth. My hair would rise with the gust and I'd stay that way, 
arms raised, hair wild, wind lacing through my fingers until my senses would tell me it was almost over. I would lower my arms according to the speed of the wind and the moment would be gone. I imagined it just enough that sometimes I believed it. I believed there was something just beyond reach and that if I discovered it, my whole life would change. This belief kept me going for a long time. A wooden stick could be a magic wand. A father could return after leaving. A new immigration law could be signed any day now. Um, so something I've been thinking, I've been thinking about, about a lot of things. Uh, I'm in school right now and it's summer. So I'm not really taking like active classes. So my, my brain is, you know, free to, to wander. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking about is the immigrants relationship with time and um, how we consider how like in order to survive, we have to have this hope that something's right around the corner, you know, like something's gonna change and something good is coming and we just need to hold on. And like, sometimes that is really attached to religion and, and like this faith of like, you know, this is all for a reason and this is all gonna get better. And all of the reasons that this is happening are gonna be clear to us in the future. Um, and we just have to be faithful to whatever it is that we're trying to be faithful to. And I've been having kind of a complicated relationship to that because there's a part of me that um, sees it as wisdom just from, you know, my elders, like the way that they have survived is that they have always kind of thrown um, their minds a little bit forward, right? Like a little bit to the future um, to imagine something that they're coming. And, and I want to honor that, um, that survival instinct. And I want to honor that, um, that it's, you know, it's, it's worked in a way. Um, but at the same time, I feel very angry at that. Um, because it, to me, like, you know, another part of me is just like, oh, it's just, um, a way to keep us, um, subdued or, or, um, to keep us from, from saying, from wanting too much or from fighting too hard or, um, from breaking away from whatever it is that we're trying to stay faithful to. And I don't know, I, um, I go back and forth when I'm thinking about that. And I try to, um, to, to put that in my writing. Um, I could never really write anything that I want to write about. Like I can't sit down and be like, I'm going to write about Dolly Parton because then nothing will come out. But sometimes like if I just like think a lot about Dolly Parton and then like later go write a poem, like she might come up, you know, like, but it has to be sort of like, I have to sneak up on it. I can't like um, just go for it. So here is another poem. Um, as I'm sure my fellow fellows know, but um, I, I, being an immigrant and being an undocumented immigrant or being an immigrant with some sort of provisionary allowance, um, it takes a lot of documentation and I am constantly losing all of my documents. Like, Cause it's, I mean, there's a part of me that's like, oh no, like what kind of immigrant am I that I'm like constantly losing my first passport, you know? But then there's another part of me that's like, who, people don't know where their first passport is. I was seven, you know, like what I'm supposed to keep up with my first passport. Anyway, so I'm kind of, you know, also torn between the two of like judgment and like also like, okay, you, you show me your first passport. Um, but this is one of those where when I have, I have uh, the Ford Action for Childhood Arrivals, which is like a provisionary thing. And I have to uh, submit to renew every two years. But also one of the things you have to do is every time you move, you have to tell USCIS that you're moving and where you're moving to. 
Um, and it's an interesting thing because you, you know, I feel like when you tell someone you're moving via letter, it's like you're, you're like, e like emailing a friend or you're writing a letter to an old friend or something. So kind of played with that a little bit in this one. It's called USCIS Change of Address Notice. I painted my headboard blue before the move, cut my hair short, you'll see in the new picture. My dog is coming with me. I haven't seen the new apartment, but it's a studio by the school. I wish I could tell you I was studying the cure for cancer, the destruction of ice, I mean ice, how to keep the planet alive. I wish I could afford a new mattress. I am tired most days from doing very little. My back hurts from sitting, from carrying, from not going anywhere. I don't stretch like I used to. Remember me like I was in my first passport, my orange lipstick, hair pulled back, not knowing the decision my parents were making, not deciding on anything myself, the flight we took, the kind of milk in the fridge. Here's something you don't know. I learned English slowly. I didn't think we'd stay. Um, this next one is called at the end of the world, we go for a walk. To speak of dangerous things, like violence and revolution, in a childhood spent collecting sticks and calling them birds. Isn't the sun trying to kill us? Wouldn't an all-knowing God know this? And wouldn't an all-knowing God get bored to death? All I want is a dishwasher. All I want is to live walking distance to everything. Every night, I remind God of all I've done for him, just in case I die in my sleep. Um, I was raised very religious and was kind of super religious well into my 20s, 33 now. Um, so writing about God in an honest way that allows me to question um, and to actually be myself <laughs> when writing about God and not just, um, you know, adoringly or whatever, takes kind of like a, a certain amount of bravery because my mom is still pretty religious. Um, and, you know, it's, it's like, it's like, how far do I go without upsetting her? Or even like, how far do I go without um, assuring that I go to hell? So like, there's like a, a fine line there of like, I'm gonna question it, but also like, <laughs> like just in case. <laughs> Let's not go too far. <laughs> um, so yeah, this one is a, a new one. I've never read it out loud, so we'll see. But um, it's the, the title of it right now is Exodus 33, 20. And it's this verse in the Bible that God tells Moses um, that he says, thou canst not see my face for there shall not man see me and live. Um, I might change the title because it's kind of an obscure verse, but but we'll see. I'm not I'm not great at titles. Um, in this one, I will say that I didn't capitalize any references to God, <laughs> which you know is like shocking. So I'm pushing the boundaries. Um, when you told Moses to avert his eyes, was he not worthy? Were you embarrassed? I think about the baby teeth we tossed onto the roof of our house. There are not enough songs about how much you take and you take and you take. 
without death, would we have lived forever? No, hundreds of years would become brittle with so much loss. I like to think a tooth that didn't wash away with the rain that wasn't picked up by the wind, yellowed from the sunlight, was discovered, recovered by a magpie who'd been searching for something just that size, a cornerstone to her nest that holds twigs and plumes and spotted baby blues. Um, and I, one more, one more poem, and this one is back to the book. Um, so I describe my book as like sad immigrant poems. Um, that's what they are. Um, and, but I have heard from people who have read it that it ends hope, like with hope. And that's very, like, I'm a very glass half empty kind of person, very pessimistic. Um, I've tried to work on it, but at this point, I'm just like, you know what? The world needs pessimists. Like, why would I, why would I not be myself? Um, so I was surprised to hear that it ends with hope. And I think that maybe like in comparison to all the other poems, my last poem is a little bit hopeful. Um, but yeah, let's finish this reading of mine with some hope. I belong to myself. I must become my own home to return to. When asked, where are you? Say, I am here. And when I feel the earth could let go at any point, relax its hold on me. I reach across my chest, my hand squeezing my own shoulder and say, I know, I know. And when asked, what are you? Answer, here, I am here. Thank you so much for, for listening. And I'm so excited to hear the next two. Well, good morning. Uh, so my name is Oswaldo Vargas. I am um, a writer here in California, 29 years old. And a uh, shout out to SOAS for inviting me here, Janine, Esther, Marcelo, founders of the Indoctor Post program, um, which I have been applying to since its inception. And it was only until last year that I finally got it because the third time, the third rejection, I'm like, okay, I think it's like, it's time. Like, let's not, let's not do it. But then I'm like, Marcelo's like, just do, you can do it one more time. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do it. And I did, and I'm really happy I did. Um, and so I'm very, very happy about that. And so I write largely about uh, my farm worker experience. Um, I've been, we, me and my family live on a farm uh, nearby in a town called Galt, California. Um, and my professionally, like I was working there for like about four years after I graduated high school, cause this was about 2010 and about that time that was about the only thing you could really do with someone in my situation. And so I did that for four years, funded myself through community college and then got to Davis to do undergrad in uh, history. Um, but around the same time in 2016 is when I started writing what I consider to be like my, the beginning of this career of mine. Um, and it all started with the boy. And so the first, uh, let's see. So I have a manuscript going on and it's called uh, To Salazar and Back. And these are all from that collection that I'm hoping to have out there one day. And the first one is called A Noble House of Zal Salazar. <clears throat> he gets me a beer, halfway through it, I unravel. Mistake, mistake, oh God, mistake. The waitress asks if I'm okay. How do I say that I hope he knows my weight before the night is done? He can sell my bones when he's done with me and I'd still ask which one fetched more money. He drops me off, but I still pretend my steps lead up to his family home. The spot in the hallway reserved for the portrait of his bride. Mount me on a wall, call me a success. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, second one is uh, titled uh, Subjects of Enugi. Um, and this one is uh, inspired by a Sumerian god, a very, very old god of agriculture. And I think considered one of the first ones uh, titled Enugi, E-N-N-U-G-I. 
And so I just read it from that perspective. <clears throat> I've done this for so long, I began to name the corn stalks and lead processions for when they buckle. I dig lanes where the machines forget to. I am a student of water, my teacher nowhere to be found. I have a theory for who is behind this wind that chills my wet back. Anugi, Sumerian god of water, take over my arms when I just can't anymore, like you did with my parents. We only get to ask Anugi one question per lifetime. Mine is, do you know if the sun has nicknames for us or if it reacts at all when we are called our people's slur? <clears throat> Third one I got for you today is a call at Tacos Romero in Galt, California. It's this cute little taco truck near the train tracks there. And it's only called that because I was in line once and there was this very beautiful man in line. And this is the result. <clears throat> While in line, I noticed his shirt stuck to his chest, just like mine. Tell me more about the field that soaked you and what you traded for all these tendrils growing out your back. Now with a better grip, thanks to my goosebumps still saluting you, Captain Operation Pull Him Under is going according to plan. Uh, the next one I have for you today is called uh, To Diego, who called me maize. Our tassels grow higher than any tax bracket we'd ever be in. I like this soil, even if it isn't healthy for us. On the days the lanes between us ran dry, you handed me water tucked away for this moment. Like conquistadores who dot the horizon, the trucks assemble, nothing personal. We are just from a parched nation. We unhusk and grind harder. It's okay. I'd know those tops of corn silk anywhere. Uh, the next one I have is called a migrant lover syndrome. And this one was inspired by a former love of mine whose brother warned him that I was with him for a green card. This is inspired by that. <laughs> migrant lover syndrome. Don't you know he just wants to use you for a green card? Joke's on you. I'm at your doorstep, mouth stuffed with whole clothes. Look how I bite down. At least my teeth pass the test. Even muffled, your family name couples with mine. A hymn queued up by a bell ringer who will one day wake up early to go wake our tallest supporters. Uh, the next one I have for you today is called uh, To the Monarch, inspired by one of my favorite authors, Toni Morrison, in the prologue to her one of her novels, Home. She has she sets the scene with horses, and the subject, or rather the speaker, is talking about how they are standing like men, and that just always stuck with me. And so I just took one of those lines and ran with it, inspired by her. So this is To the Monarch. We stood like monarchs who forgot they were in diaspora. I'm sorry we forgot to fly south. We just found a place to put our bags down. The locals wonder why we carry so much and crane their necks for the chance to look upon our spines. Bulging out as they also want to breathe in the air of the new sanctuary where our kind flutter about. This is our culture. Me and a stranger can eye the same zenia plant and take turns. Nectar looks better on him. He rolls in the excess that drips down in the name of the season. If he'd like, he can visit the branches I'm more used to and leak with me there. Uh, let's see. <laughs> the next one I have is titled, I'll skip that one. I will do one called Kneeling in a City Park. And I just want to preface this by saying I didn't actually do this. It was just in a moment of heartbreak. And this is what happened, me just sitting in the park and thinking, oh, what if I actually like was reacting this way? <clears throat> because I'm afraid, oh, sorry. <clears throat> Kneeling in a City Park. Because I'm afraid the sun will find out more than it's supposed to. So I tried to find some shade. The clouds come in and I need new shoes. I haven't had water for what it feels like eons and I'm sure will, my skin will slide off of me any second. Oh God, please let it fall into lovelier hands. My dad used to bury stillborn calves and I swear this is my punishment. The accomplice holding the shovel found and tried. The city forbids people from picking the fruit fallen from trees. Maybe it's a big ask to stay intact long enough to, so I can scratch into an orange peel. I want to smell like an orchard that's only a bus stop away where a man and a fa can be found, proud of me. Uh, I have just two more left for you today. Uh, one is called Gemini Prince Come Home. Happy Gemini season. Um, I'm turning 30 on, on June 1st and it's actually really exciting because like, I mean, I've been undocumented for like almost 28 years technically, which is weird when you really think about it. I'm like, how, do, how does someone just stay in this for so long? But there are plenty of people that can speak to that and even longer. Um, so 
but I only mentioned that because it was just something that was on my mind and the Gemini aspect of it, just like these dualities and, you know, living in the in-between and these sorts of things that we can definitely get into later. Um, but I have a bit of a time limit, so. <clears throat> Gemini Prince, come home. No wonder Geminis are buried the deepest. I am the other half that lives on. I come back out of the earth to say it isn't fair. He was supposed to stay up with me when the satellites powered down back to the surface. Jump from one to one like we used to on the supermarket tile. My, our parents' voices call out for us to come back to the front. We think we have all the time to chalk the borders of our kingdom here, there, and also here. Instead, I'm drafting his eulogy, a string of I love yous after every coffee mug gone cold on his porch, brewed before every cry for yet another boy nicknamed Renaissance. My last poem for you today is called Ancestral Game, and it's, named, it's inspired by my grandpa, who I never got to actually meet, unfortunately. Um, so I was born in Mexico, and I was brought to this country, to the U.S., before I was even a year old. Um, so that whole thing is just a complete abstract to me. Um, and so is even, even the idea of, like, who my grandparents were. And thankfully, I've got to meet the grandparents on my mother's side who got to visit on a visa. Um, but on my dad's side, I never got to visit them, unfortunately, or see them. Um, but I like to think of him, like, around, and that's what this poem is about. Ancestral game. Abuelo who I picture with a voice like Clark Gables, ringing out whenever he took off his shoes in the lobby, always starting off each conversation with an apology for accusing my dad of stealing money from the shop to buy me milk years ago. He stood no higher than my shoulders, but I could always find his hands on them, insisting that as his grandson, I had the magic and vocabulary to thumb through his book full of people he had wronged. You will keep writing in this, mijo, but that's okay. You are worth the blood. Thank you so much. Um, good, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody across the time zones. Um, like everybody said, it's so beautiful, so fun, so exciting to be here amongst the other Undocted Poets Fellows with you, Janine, and with the SOAS Center. Um, yeah, I feel so lucky and so so like full of joy to be part of this community. It makes it made me really happy to be uh, to get that acceptance letter. Um, yeah, I'm gonna read poems from no collection or from the act of collection or the act of generation. Um, and my name is Toby Kasim. Um, I'm here at the local at the local library where I work in the study room, which is very quiet, which is great. Um, and yeah, I'll just read a few things that I prepared before the poems and we'll get into it. So in attempting to cultivate a wide ranging poetic practice, I don't and can't always address questions about undocumentation or being documented directly. Um, I'm also like, like Alina said, I'm, un, I'm also in DACA, which is like a provisional status that keeps you from being directly criminal in the eye of the law, but also like intensifies the, the law's attention to you. Like it, it intensifies the law surveillance of you. So, you know, one way that I think about undocumentation and documentation is just like how, how um, kooky it is as a, as a semi-category. It's always, you're always kind of in between two places. And that ultimately becomes, I think, a kind of strength for poets, for thinkers, for anybody, really, if you don't want to think of yourself as singular. You want to consent to being, <laughs> consent to not to be a single being, as, uh, as Fred Moen and Edward Wissant say. Um, and of course, I wouldn't be the writer I am without displacement. Um, I wouldn't be the right I am without the alienation of being of a place and being absented from the record of the story of that place the place wants to tell. Um, it gives you, it gave me a chance to cultivate a voice that um, tries to exceed, tries to survive, and tries to defy the logic of documentation. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is poetry is a language in which I've chosen to believe in magic. Um, and maybe extend that logic into my work. Um, I think the most resistant trace of documentation in my work is the question of separation. Um, my family, when we first immigrated to this country, we immigrated as half of us. So I actually grew up um, separate from my younger two siblings, Ogo and Dotsun, um, and they grew up in Nigeria. And I grew up here with my brother and my parents. Um, and as I've grown up and cultivated like meaningful relationships with all my siblings. Um, it's kind of created 
this urge and this desire to think of separation beyond the physical, um, to think about how presence persists and presence um, survives the kinds of um, restrictive work that documentation can perform, the ways that colonial logic, documentary logic can kind of make you feel like your body is being literally constrained, uh, literally um, held, held apart from what you want to be with or what, how you want to feel. Um, so I think that that question will kind of be threaded through the poems I've chosen. Um, and I hope but also, like, like all the poems that we've heard today, I hope that we'll hear um, the kind of the protest against unfreedom, protest against silence that the status and document assumes. Um, I like the I like this collaborative creation of a different record, a different archive for the the idea of undocumentation and the idea of immigration. Um, I think, yeah, I'm again very grateful for everybody here. Um, this first poem is called Natal Shark. It kind of appears in um, in vignettes that are separated by asterisks. Um, I think at, at some point those are meant to represent stars, like being a Libra. Um, so I'll call it natal chart for now, and that might change. Natal chart. The last time I saw my sister, she looked like my sister, eight years younger, their sixth birthday. Resemblance runs so strong in our blood, it put an, an ocean between us to slow the difference. My eyes sweat over the false logic of replacement. Simi is a growing echo across the distance. Everything Dutsun does travels to reach us. Nigeria is a living sacrifice amplified in thickening time. Remember to call home displacement, delay. Zoom in again. Everything in my mom's house is a metaphor for the cosmos, place with holes in them, ovens open for sun, low hum under pictures growing apart. We're all parallel tracks of each other overlap deviations, DNA reaching. Quote, when two universes are in phase, they are coherent. Rooms are full of frequencies we, we can't isolate. Inner ears scratchy for voice in American vacuum. If the band that expands to keep the universe contained had a name, it would be called the universe. Kasim, Kasim from the Arabic, one who divides, one who distributes. I intended to share widely, to turn severance into a house. We moved from my father to fill the ellipse in his brother's affairs. Strongholds still ate his house, rupture gravities of departure. Me and my brothers had an airplane in the cabinet. We let our coordinates drift in the dark. I touched windows at night and joined the dots in widening rings to keep finding you, your residue in orbit. To meet you, I curved the line, keeping time apart. Okay. This next poem is called Family Stone. It's about um, one of the times I wasn't, I hadn't finished college yet and I was working at my dad's um, granite shop. Um, and at this point, I had become documented. My, parent, my dad was still undocumented and, and continues to be. Um, so whenever we, we would like go to Home Depot or rent tools, I would, I would have to show my ID, um, which is fine. It literally was just an ID, but they would ask him and I would be the one to like present the ID because I know what we we're getting. I just, I was just there and support. Um, that was also a fun experience because like everybody at the granite shop spoke Spanish except for us. Um, so it was always, it was like a, a moment of both connection and separation with like the immigrant community in DC and in Northern Virginia around this. Um, this is called, it's a family stone. When they asked my daddy for ID, I showed them mine. When we needed blades and generators to light the granite factories operations, I botched my name for those rentals, my murky illegitimacy. When the big saw sliced through stone, water gushed from the cuts and ran all the words I've ever written through the sluices. Heavy gray slurry with twinkles every now and then, like a slate lake catching the night sky. Those elastic evenings, we cut templates of strangers' kitchens until after mommy called about dinner. I learned to measure the lines and endurance draws out of these long hours, crawling to set the seams in place, creases in the stone patience of our prayers. Pant legs starch bone white with dust we wear off the factory floor. 
That year with you is just a taste of Earth's finest light in my lung. I hear a glint of quartz turn in your chest when you cough dust out of sleep. I think your wings must be alabaster by now with all the bronchial flowers you bloom. Occasionally a mistake rings my phone. A credit company asks for you. You mean my dad? I inflect. Flex whatever debt they call to collect. I lie. All of it is surely mine. Um, also shout out to Alina. Um, this is <laughs> this could be a poem about not having a birth certificate. Um, it's called Mother Tongue, but I'm gonna subtitle it birth certificate for today. Uh, Mother Tongue. My first love was stillness. My favorite memory is my mother remembering that even breathing for me was about was turbulent at birth. Instead of wails, I filled my lungs with sips of air, punctuated yips, tested voice carefully. Because mom laughs between each imitated baby bleat, every breath is a punchline. My life was slated for another. In the womb, I chilled so stone still they painted my room pink, prepared for prettier. But prophecies always find their truest expression. The ring that spun clockwise over mom's tummy must have hypnotized me or slow time to this crawl I, count out, I can't outpace. Always late, up late in my sister's time zone, she recalls our mother's intimation. It listens like a daughter to me, and I sleep redrawn as what I can be in tentative acts, a daughter, son, the quiet that says, I love, I'm, I'm lonely too. 50-50, the supposed probability splitting speech and silence, son and daughter life and being dead. Still, it won't cover the gradients of possible elisions our first breaths seep between. Uh, this is called Crude at the International School. It's about the Nigerian school. Well, this part, it starts about, about the Nigerian school that my siblings and I went to, and then it just kind of goes off the rails. Um, crude at the International School. In Nigeria, our white lady headmaster asked me to speak to my parents about my brother sounding like a Nigerian. Toxic properties in speech called my, my blood separate from itself, like oil unprepared for the global marketplace. So this is accent study for a reckoning with what's left. Me and my brother are still the same voice. I put my hand in his teeth to feel the edge he leaves unrefined and wear it in red where I write. Some people come and call us patrol thieves on camera, like we weren't dipped in black gold at birth, head to toe, dripping smoke from our homestyle refinery. Local authorities spill our work back into the water we drink, call our survival their property and anchor it further out at sea. My brother and I grew up on opposite faces of an oil spill, eating ink until our visions converged, and swallowed so much in the same slick throat. Words bloated with the distance that rushes in my open mouth search for you. I know we meet when it's blood in the water, not money, not the braided shimmer of ropes. Oh, and sometimes <laughs> being undocumented also means falling in love with someone who lives in a different country and not being able to leave forever. Just being, you know, in a long distance relationship because of uh, USCIS or DHS. Or uh, this is called Astral Trailer. Um, astral Trailer, because there's a shadow in everything that gets too excited to ask you its dimension. When you tell me your dreams, what kind of engines they're hitched to. But, so I might never build it one day. But I feel your dreams widen, making room for my consciousness. So maybe I didn't have to ask. I felt the dream shell to propel itself toward discoveries of further reasons to celebrate those enclosures where we cannot touch and muffle their questions. I asked what the astral plane is for, an early sense of what it could be like on the other side of these windows where the first light comes in slightly obscured by weeds. I wake up twice every day against the difference between our sunrises. A little darkness lifts when I feel you get up, then actual light fills the distance. What happens between my awareness that you're awake and my waking? I won't call it sleep since you show me how to keep my eyes closed to see. 
Um, the last one I'm going to read is actually, I never do this, but I, <laughs> I went back to my undergrad workshops, uh, final hey, packet. This is my first workshop in 2015 with Sally Keith. Um, and one of the notes in the in Sally's response grade was, you know, you have a lot of questions about distance and separation in this in this packet. And I was like, oh, I, <laughs> I mean, like when I was when I was first writing, I, I didn't I didn't think of it as anything to do with immigration. But I think one of the fun things about poetry is the way it like deepens your questions without you knowing it. And so all of a sudden you're writing about what you've been living um more honestly but i uh yeah i think it's fun this poem is interesting i don't know that it's a great poem but it's also a vignette um and it was untitled and it's about distances okay. untitled every morning i swing my car into a space between two cars most mornings i cannot see that space but i envision it behind me as i fill it then the space is inside of me and i am inside of it an idea of its emptiness persists we hold each other in the dark. Your lung expands against my chest. The space between our breathing is drum skin thin. I wonder if you stop breathing. Would the disruption help me forget how? I was in the grocery store checkout line and I forgot to separate my purple toothbrush from another's frozen pizza with that little black bar. I had to snatch the toothbrush off the conveyor belt and apologize because our cashier was conv convinced that I shared a life and a home with a stranger and I could have loved her in her startled face. I hope you don't sense an attack on your identity, but I can't, I can't imagine that you are so different from her or more different from her than you are from me. I sometimes inhabit the spans between us. Sometimes I feel a bridge still living outside of me, and this can be enough. Thank you. Thank you all so much for those readings. Uh, I feel um, just maybe this is a little unfair to say, but I feel like um, with with every other reading, with every other encounter um, in poetry, um, I feel like there's always some part of me that is uh, in the reserves um, or maybe perpetually in hiding. I'm not entirely sure, but. I feel like that part of me is always activated in a different way when I'm with my people. Um, when I when I hear you all read your work, when I when I read your, when I encounter your work out in um, in in like journals or um, you know just watching you read at different events, um, yeah, I just feel like I'm activated in a very very different way. Um, and some other part of me is much more alive that that usually isn't. I don't know. Maybe that feels unfair to say about all these other poets who I love and admire, and just other works that I read. But um, certainly, something something different feels like happens when um, when I'm with you all. Um, I think one of the things that excites me most about being in a room with you all, even if it's a virtual space, um, is how I'm constantly reminded of um of like the the subjects the themes the words that uh that i approach in different ways and that i watch you all approach in different ways right like i feel like there's nothing i want to hear more than to hear uh your thoughts on um you know if i take something that uh that annie mentioned on the slash right and uh and your feelings about the slash or if i'm picking up from something that alini mentioned your feelings about time right it's like a swallow tell me about time or annie tell me about time or um, in thinking about uh, Oswaldo's work, it's like, Toby, tell me about love, right? Or Alini, tell me about love. Like, this is the only way that I want to hear about and know about um, and think about love. It's through this, like, it, it filtered through the undocumented or the formerly undocumented experience. Um, you know, thinking too about something that Toby mentioned, you know, tell me about magic. Right? It's like, I don't want to hear about magic, except for how maybe Annie might talk about magic or, you know, or uh, Oswaldo might talk about magic. Um, like I said, I think it just activates my brain in a different way. And I'm already, um, uh, I'm already just excited to hear about, you know, what does, what does magic, what does love, what does time and what does the slash mean for, um, for someone who has had our very specific 
um, and also varying experiences. Um, I wanted to, now that we're into the, the question portion of this event, I actually wanted to open with a question of my own that builds off of, um, uh, off of these words, the slash time, love, magic, also thinking about um, something that Toby had said too about how um, the law intensifies its attention to us and how we in turn intensify our attention to experience and to language. Um, I've been thinking quite a bit too, like Alini, about time um, and how time and our, um, our way of writing through time and thinking about time as it relates to our work, um, I think just appears in different or likely appears in different ways and manifests in different ways in either our practice or our poems themselves. Um, you know, I think about my own work and how um, the poems that I wrote in Driving with Loud and License always feel or have felt urgent to me in a different way than, um, than, the, than the newer poems that I've been working on. Um, my relationship to time also uh, factored into when it was that I started submitting my work and when it was I felt like I was allowed to submit my work for publication. Um, you know, sometimes I just held on to poems for a long time because I was either waiting until guidelines were going to change or until other members of my family um, felt safe or safer to me, or I felt safe or safer <laughs> to the world. Um, so I was just curious if um, if you all might want to speak a little bit to, um, to your relationship with time and how... Um, how maybe man those however it is that you feel about time and your experience with time as someone who is uh you know currently or formerly undocumented how that manifests in your practice um and or how it manifests in um in your work itself i will i can go ahead um i because I'm also on DACA, uh, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival. So for me, like, life always feels like it's a three-year interval. And then it's like, okay, next time. Like, what comes next? Because it's like, when people ask me what I want to do for, like, the next five or ten years, I'm always like, girl, I wish I could tell you. Because I, I can't. I can't. And so it's really, like, and, you know, there's a, tra there's a bit of a tragedy to that, like, having to be dependent on that sort of, like, interval of, like, okay, when do I have to put, apply again? Which I think for me is, like, October of next year, even though, thankfully, now they can do it online and I haven't done that yet, which I'm really excited about. Um, just having, like, that whole process, the whole ritual of getting everything together and getting everything, like, another, like, an like semi-annual annual reminder that, oh, this is my, this is my situation. Um, but I would say it definitely manifests in my work in that just the like knowing that there's I'm not it's like a luxury even to even think of time in a very long term so for me like it's very hard to think anything more than like two or three years so that's how I approach things I would say yeah so um my mom married a citizen I think eight years ago. So she started the process for me. Um, and being Brazilian, it takes less time than being Mexican. Um, so if there's a line, then like, it's my country. And if a family member applies for you, depending where, which family, like we are relation, and then it depends on what country you're from. Um, and of course, now the pandemic is delaying everything. Um, so it's been the first time that I've had the luxury to think more long term. Um, and that's how I even applied for an MFA program because I was like, oh, I think I'll be able to finish it. <laughs> like, I just never wanted to start one and then be like, wait, can I, am I going to be able to finish it? Um, so I definitely can relate with what Osvaldo just, just said. But also, I think um, when I think about like time in the sense of how much time I have to write or to think about writing. Um, I wrote the first book very frantically. Um, I was working in a religious organization that was becoming more and more conservative and more and more blatant in their anti-immigrant uh, like sentiments. Um, and, you know, with the former president, 
running and seeing the the religious people around me that I thought were my people um, gravitate towards him even during the primary felt very uh, like a betrayal or even it was like a betrayal but then the secondary feeling was oh my gosh how dumb am I <laughs> like you know like this this like need to blame yourself for falling for it um, because that makes me feel better than if it, it, it's it makes me feel better to think this is my fault I shouldn't have fallen for it than it is for me to think this is how the world is right um, and there's nothing I could have done so I was going every day driving to a Starbucks even if I was late to work and I was often late to work because I was I, I I'm depressed and I was not on medication back then so I would be, I would be like, if work starts at nine, it would be like 10 a.m. I'm getting out of bed and I'm like, I have to go to Starbucks. And I would go for 30 minutes and I would write just frantically. Um, and when I look back at those poems now, I'm like, oh yeah, like I needed to get them out. Where now, um, being in an MFA program in a very liberal environment, feeling relatively much safer, um, it is different because the poems now don't feel as urgent um, and it feels more like I, you know, I'm on medication, <laughs> I'm seeing a therapist. Um, I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like, yeah, as urgent. And that's been, that's been interesting because I thought that that's how one would generate poetry is, is through that urgency. Um, so now I'm like, oh, that's, I don't know, like, at, you know, I was worried at first because <laughs> I was like, oh no, like if I don't have that pressure, if I don't have that much conflict or that much fear, will I be able to write poetry? Um, but I think the answer is yes. So, yeah. Um. Yeah, I think this is such a good question. And the question of urgency too is something that I've also thought about because most of the poems in the book were written between 2016 and 2019 when it felt really urgent for me to write and to address more directly um, what it meant to be undocumented or what it meant to be on DACA, which I was at the time. Um, I think for me though, more recently, I think time actually sort of to what um, Toby mentioned about, I think in one of your poems, you mentioned like bending like time to meet someone. And that really spoke to me because um, the longing that's in these poems and the urgency is actually more related to like family separation and to that, kind of separation in space and in time um, than it really was to any kind of overt political situation or you know maybe in tandem um, because 2016 was also the first year that I was able to go back to China and see my family. So it was me and my mom who are here and the whole rest of our family is in China. And it had been, I think 17 years by that point. Um, and I was able to go because my grandfather was sick. Um, and I think it wasn't until then that I realized that there was the me who had left and the 17 years, which of course I lived, but there was always this sort of parallel self that was just stationary, right? And so then to be able to go back and to find that Xi'an, China has changed so much during those 20 years, you know, those two decades basically, that nothing existed except for the people that I was going back to. So something very quickly, I think what really motivated me to write a lot of the family poems was this realization of actually this, this sort of like illusion of the self who stayed put is one that was quickly um, crumbled by my going back. Um, and poetry I think is incredible because you can, you can bend space time, you can astral project, you can exist in multiple places and you can conjure a space for you to be with those people. Um, and so I think that's 
partially why I was so drawn to, to poems and to thinking about um, time in that way. Yeah, I think, yeah, the, the question of time zones and spending time is, yeah, and, and, have, and having to consider, um, both consider your sacrifices and the sacrifices that people are making at different, you know, different times of day to kind of meet in a middle. Um, yeah, it informs my sense of love and it informs my sense of like acts of care, definitely. Um, one of the one of the questions about time that fluctuates for me is, um, especially with separation, is like there's a, there's a way I could say I've been physically apart from my sister for almost 20 years. My anniversary in America would be next year, 2023. So it'd be like 20th anniversary. And there's a way that the way the, the way the numbers accumulate is really it feels disturbing. Like if if like when you say when you go from five to ten years, it feels like I don't know, it's like a, it's a kind of despair. Um, so I think even though I have I, I might never work it out, I think there's a sense of like trying to trying to cultivate a different sense of time and a different sense of time's passage um, that doesn't feel like it's also creating waste or vanity in its wake. Um, and I think one way that I've tried to do that is to kind of consider all the little gaps and deferrals that undocumentation has created in my life as creating interesting products, different products and different, different awarenesses that I would never have had the time or the space to create on my own. So I think one of the, like my older brother and I both being undocumented and not being supported by like counselors or whatever, had a really hard time figuring out how to pay for school for the first the first two year, two or three years that we were trying to go to college. So we split, you know, we split like a year or two in between a year of school, just like because it was like, how are you gonna how are you gonna cover twenty thousand dollars for one for one year of school if you don't have a scholarship or a financial aid? And I think so we process it differently. I think those two years made a lot of our awareness of the world. Like the, the years that weren't being we weren't being educated, we had to kind of deal with drudgery, like dealing with you know minimum wage labor, dealing with most of your friends being on campuses across the country and you being in your high school town, um, and making your own meaning out of that experience was really vital for me as a person and like that was when I, I I think that was when I read the most in my life was when I was just I was just working at a restaurant going home working at my dad's shop going home and like my friends were like I would call my friends once in a while and talk to them on the phone um and I think that ultimately really prepared me to take the act of reading and writing much more seriously because that was a real life source for me, and, and I, I, you know, I, I could have been much sadder <laughs> about it than I was. And maybe, I'm, maybe I'm also a little bit introverted, so I, I didn't have as, as hard a time as some people might have had. But I think I could have been much sadder about it if I didn't have some some like lifelines in the art, in the experience of movies, books, music that I, I had to cultivate for myself. Um, and I think, yeah, just growing up, I mean, like, you know, understanding things um, a little bit more universally, a little bit more like in terms of uh, shared discomfort, shared pain has helped. Like, I think I probably went from a, a little, a, a more solipsistic experience of that, of like undocumentation and separation to being like, oh, how is this, how is this feeling affecting a wider community? Like, how do I, how do I see this? playing out in my parents' interactions with me? How do I see this playing out in my interactions with my siblings? And how can I do something about that, both in the world and on the, and on the page? Um, so I think, yeah, just being being open to like letting time teach you things when it's not the time you want to, not the time you want to have, <laughs> you know, not the kind of time you want to have has been important to me in the spaces of like, just like ongoing waiting, ongoing like, expectation and hope that you have to you have to deal with as an immigrant. Uh, yeah. And 
Uh, thank you very much. I'll, um, I'll um, come in now uh, to manage maybe some, if we have time to address one, one or two questions. Um, I just wanted to thank you very much again on behalf of SOAS and the other conveners of the series. It's been fantastic to uh, be here tonight to listen to your readings and uh, very, very emotional and uh, very uh, powerful um, as well. Um, unfortunately, the time is a little bit running out. Uh, we could have stayed here all night, to, to be fair, <laughs> listening to more of your poems so will actually be fantastic. And hopefully you can maybe come back uh, to SOAS. You know, now traveling is open. Uh, please, if you are, you know, uh, planning to come to London, reach out to us because it would be really nice to actually see you performing live um, in front of an audience. And um, as you know, poetry is a performance. And so uh, in a way, Zoom, it is a little bit limited, but it was fantastic uh, to, to have you tonight. Um, perhaps I can just try to close the, uh, the evening with one more question, if you don't mind going a little bit over time. Um, there is just one question that has been uh, also Ludi, uh, our other convener who's not here tonight, uh, she wanted to pose this question. So I am posing it on behalf of, the, of um, um, myself and my colleagues. Uh, our question is about what assumptions about poetry your work do you resist the most? So this idea of because uh, resistance and uh, came through and uh, perhaps uh, it would be nice for if uh, we can hear from you briefly, unfortunately, if you could maybe expand just in a few words uh, on this question before we close. Thank you. I leave it to all of you to, to take it uh, one by one. Thank you. Um. I have a lot of things that I feel like I could say about this, um, but I think right now, the thing that I'm most resistant to is something that uh, Janine alluded to earlier, that like poetry will not save the world. Um, poetry is not like the answer. Um, I, it would be very nice if it was, you know, but it's not. So um, I do feel like, that's something that I try to resist. Like, I, I do think that poetry helps human beings come to a better place within themselves and within society so that they can act towards more liberation, towards more um, actual revolution and, and change in society. But poetry in itself will not do that. Um, and I think that sometimes I see people kind of glorify or over go, go like oh yes po and I'm like it's just it's just not so um and and my poetry isn't going to do that and, and other people's poetry won't so that's my my biggest beef currently thank you I'll say the, the logic of confession <laughs> I don't I don't really I don't I mean I do retell things and I I like say things that have happened, but I feel like there's a kind of expectation of uh, revelation, nudity, um, bare, strict fairness that I, I resist because I think it might be replication of a kind of um, official gaze that I don't like. <laughs> Related to that, I've also been thinking about um, like the relationship between accessibility and so-called experimentation and innovation. And I feel like there's kind of an expectation that goes along with confessional or so-called confessional poetry to be really accessible. And that pressure is doubly put on writers of color or like, you know, undocumented poets or, you know, I feel like it's kind of this extra burden to have to bear. Um, you know, even though I think for myself, that's sort of a place that I, I thrive and I'm happy in, but I'm also, I feel like we have to allow for, like, and I think this is something I love that Janine always stresses, like the aesthetic variation in how to talk about an experience, how to write about an experience. Um, yeah, and I think it's similarly like innovation and like kind of how work can be liberatory often it isn't like kind of a direct confrontation with the thing that we're resisting, right? That I think Toby, your word was like exceeding kind of the logic of the carceral state. And I think 
maybe that excess is, um, you know, it can be fun, it can be, it can be sort of wild, and it can um, not look like what we expect. And that's, that's sort of where I'm aiming for these days. I think for me, I come just regionally, like where I'm at, like the big thing that I find myself in is like, Latino poetry, like Latino American, specifically Mexican American experience that I see that I tend to come across the most. And of course, being Mexican and being in the States, like, I guess I would be part of that school of thought. It's just that when I think about like the motifs that I go to, like the symbolisms that are very, very often done, like the drafts of the early drafts of like, you know, for Diego who called me Maiz, like, people hated the title and I can tell why because it was just like an emphasis on like corn and like you know like over emphases on like monarch butterflies for example like in the U.S. like that's a big symbol of like migration is beautiful even though not really like it's actually kind of terrible but I've always wanted to I've always resisted the urge to say like that like Mexican American poetry for example has like tapped out everything in terms of like being able to present something new as a different product and so my goal is to like even if it's necessary even if it is like the same motif like the monarch poem for example like i made it to a point where it's like it wasn't about migration it was just like the physicality of a butterfly how that looks and just using nectar as like a very vivid sexual metaphor but so there, there's that like me trying to like push that just a little bit to uh go against the notion that there's nothing really to left to write about within that particular school of poetry. And that's how I'm gonna do it. Whether I succeed or not, we'll check in in like five or six years time, we'll see. <clears throat> Brilliant, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you all answer like um, the question very, very thoroughly. And, um, and um, I'm not sure if my colleagues, uh, perhaps uh, Amma and Fazana, they, they want to say um, have some comments. And also I wanted Janine perhaps to come in for some final comments as well before we close um, uh, as the chair of, the, of today. And uh, it would be nice to, um, so yeah, so I leave it to, um, I think, yeah. Janine, do you want to perhaps make some final comments? Really, I just oh. want to thank you all. Um, thank so as for um, for for creating this space, I mean, we've been talking so much about time, and um, you know, I just think again about our relationship to time, even just in terms of organizing these kinds of events. Um, you know, for me, it, it it feels when we get to do something like this, it feels much more than you know just putting an entry into my calendar. It really feels like people have to like bend space and time to align the portals for all of the Andaki poets and all of the Andaki poets fellows to be able to meet at a particular moment um, and kind of like squeak through this like portal that's been made for us um, to share the space. Um, you know, as, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, and also I think as the other fellows have, um, have, have brought up throughout this event, um, we don't all get to talk outside of email very often. And, um, uh, you know, events like this make it possible for us to, to see each other <laughs> and sometimes to get to know each other and to, to hear each other's work. Um, and so really just, I, I'm just, I'm just so thankful. Um, and I know that she's here in the audience somewhere. Um, I, I want to just also extend um, our thanks to Esther Lynn, who helped create, um, who helped kind of bridge this partnership with uh, SOAS. Um, yeah, so yeah, thank you. It's just, it's just been really lovely. Hi, I just wanted to say thank you so much to you all. I unfortunately came a bit late, but um, I was just so inspired with your work. And I think I'd like to echo what uh, Angelica was saying, it would be so amazing to see you perform this uh, in person. That would be a wonderful experience. And I look forward to exploring more of your work um, and reading more. Thank you so much. And I'd just like to add my thanks and particularly for highlighting what I believe is that all human experience is real and important. And I think that's, that's, that's the essence of what I've taken from that. that we are all human beings and all of our experiences are important um, and, and, and real and meaningful. So thank you very much. 
Great, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, for my co-convener and thanks to Janine for chairing uh, uh, this uh, incredible panel. And uh, yes, unfortunately, we are already a bit over time. Uh, but as we said, please, let's stay connected and uh, let's keep writing poems, please. And um, uh, please uh, uh, come to see us to share more with our students. And uh, we really look forward to, to see you again and to, and to read more um, about your work and your poems. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, you all so much. As well, thank, thank you for joining. And thank, thank you, you bye. for joining. So bye. Bye for so now. Thank you. Okay, bye, guys. Uh, thank just you, to everyone. say, the event has been recorded and will be available soon uh, on YouTube. And I will, I will connect with all of you. Thank you. Bye. Good night and, yeah. and good day. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye for now.